This animated documentary is brought to you by the New Historia Store, the best in apparel for fans of mythology and the ancient world. Check out the brand new Ancient Rome collection, link in the description. At capacity, there'd be over 50,000 cheering, screaming fans in the arena at once. The energy would be palpable. It would have rivaled some of our best stadiums in terms of attendance, but our arena is empty. I apologize, I did try to put the full 50,000 digital spectators in the arena. I really did. 50,000 virtual Romans. My computer said how dare you, then it set itself on fire. I'll upgrade so next time we'll have a little more company. In this documentary you'll get to see exactly what the famous gladiators of the Colosseum looked like. If you want to see all of the known gladiators that fought in the arena, their equipment, strengths and weaknesses, this is the definitive video. By the end of this, you will know everything there is to know about the different gladiators that battled in ancient Rome. You'll get to see the standard combatants, but also incredibly unorthodox, borderline outlandish fighters. The types that use exotic weapons, armor, and strategies most people have never even seen before. So, let's dim the lights and bring out our first gladiator. Sam Knight Samnite gladiators were arguably the first class of gladiators. They were based on Samnium warriors after Rome conquered them in battle. Helmets of the Samnite would be heavy and visored, featuring a high crest with decorative feathers. Samnite gladiators would wear one protective greave on their leg, and their arms would be wrapped in leather or metal bands for additional protection. This arm guard is called a manica. Samnite swords were the infamous gladius, and their shields were called scutum. These two pieces of equipment are essentials that you'll see frequently today. Here's a really quick scutum and gladius 101, so we can get on to the other gladiators. This was the sword used by Rome to conquer the globe. The gladius is a short sword featuring two sharp cutting edges and a tapered point for stabbing. The sharp steel blade was incredibly deadly. These swords had a hilt with indentations or knobs that made it easier to grip. This exceptional sword gave us our English word gladiator. A scutum was a generously sized, curved, rectangular shield. It was designed to be carried in one hand and was made of wood and leather. Its edges and center were reinforced with metal and its large size made it useful in protecting almost the entire body. In close quarters, was the perfect companion to the gladius. Soldiers hid behind their shields, got close and thrust their efficient gladius swords at the enemy. Let's go back to the Samnites for a sec. Something very strange happened to the Samnites. Samnites were a standard part of almost every show in the arena until they seemingly vanished from history. They completely disappeared from the record books, like ghosts. So why did they disappear from all records? This happened because of Samnium, the land where this type of gladiator came from. Rome did conquer Samnium, but many years of arena battles passed and what had happened between Samnium and Rome all those years ago had now been forgotten. Samnium and Rome were now allies. They were now an important part of Roman society, but the problem was, in most fights, Samnites were still being positioned as the bad guys. The Romans solved this though. Samnite gladiators were removed from the roster and replaced with several similar gladiator classes. Samnites essentially became the foundation for most gladiators. Our next gladiator shares a whole lot with the Samnites. They too went through a strategic rebranding and emerged with some distinctly unique qualities. Gallus Mormillo The Celtic Gauls followed a similar story to the Samnites. Gaulish warriors inspired a new type of gladiator called the Gallus. Like the Samnites, they were very popular, so rather than removing them from the spectacle entirely, they would be renamed to Mormillo. 
Galus gladiators looked remarkably similar to Sam Knights with only a couple of changes occurring, morphing them into the Mormilo. Their name has origins in a Greek word meaning sea fish. Like many gladiators, a Gaul or Mordmilo would be close to the equivalent of a heavyweight boxer. Their kit was not light, so it would be advantageous to be tall and strong. They had the standard loincloth, belt, scutum shield, gladius and manica, but their helmets featured feathered plumes and a large crest representing a dorsal fin. These helmets were sometimes very detailed with insignia, sculpture and other intricate artwork. They definitely had a unique look with their silver armor, which was intended to represent the scales of a fish. Sagittarius This particular type of gladiator was so unpopular, everyone left the arena when these guys fought. Sagittarius were skilled archers who wore extremely lightweight armor and commonly fought on horseback in mock nature environments. They used a bow and arrow with deadly efficacy and ended fights quickly. Deadly and effective sounds perfect for the arena, right? Why weren't they more popular? Imagine a Sagittarius gladiator had their bow and arrow poised to fire and their aim is off a little bit. He misfires. One stray arrow and... Yeah, not a fun spectator sport, right? Sagittarius fights are actually the one and only live event in all of documented history where you'd get your tickets, sit down, and be happy that some tall, oversized ogre is directly in front of you blocking the view. Oplomachus Hoplomachus are pretty similar to the Samnites, except larger and more heavily armoured. These men were tall, stocky, durable and strong. They needed great strength due to the heavy armour and extra weapons they carried. Rather than just one weapon, Hoplomachus could carry up to three. A gladius, a spear and a pulgio. A pulgio is a small auxiliary dagger typically used as a backup weapon. It's primarily made for stabbing, and as a sidearm, it complemented the gladius well. Their spear was a highly effective, sophisticated piece of equipment. A bit of wood with some sharp metal on the end. In terms of armor, they had greaves protecting the lower two-thirds of their legs. Underneath was quilted padding. The heavy leg protection was in place to compensate for their small circular shield. This bronze shield was not only a defensive weapon, the Hoplomachus also used it to bash their opponents. They threw the entirety of their heavy weight behind it. This dealt serious damage as a blunt weapon. Trax Another gladiator derived from a foreign warrior. Thracian prisoners of war were unleashed in the arena and quickly became fan favorite gladiators. Thracians and Hoplomachus were very similar and thus fought with a similar style. The main difference between the two was the iron reinforced Thracian shield. This is called a Padmula, a medium sized shield, sometimes round, sometimes rectangular. Because the shield was still relatively small, low blows were a weakness due to the Thracians large legs being exposed. To counteract this, they wore sturdy leg greaves and a manica on their dominant arm. Some Thracian helmets featured a griffin crest, a mythological creature often associated with Nemesis, the Greek goddess of retribution. If you're a keen observer, you may have noticed another unique piece of equipment. Yes, that's right, the sword is not a gladius this time. This is a Sika. A Sika is distinct from many other Roman weapons due to its slight bend. This was especially useful when paired against a Mordmilo gladiator opponent because the Sika's curve could sneak right past the edges of the Scutum shield. Retiarius Aretiarius is probably the most uniquely identifiable gladiator. 
His name literally means net man. He would have no shield, no helmet, and no sword. Instead, for armor, he would have a full-length manica on one arm and a Galerus shoulder guard. If you think about it, he was damn near running around the arena naked, an armored sleeve and a loincloth for defense. In terms of his weapons, he carried a trident, a pugio dagger, and a net. Normally, gladiators only fought other combatants of similar sizes and styles. These vanilla matchups were seen as fair, even, and entertaining. Ferretti Arius, however, would introduce a new level of excitement, unlike any gladiator before them. He would be the first to compete against entirely new classes, creating a new wave of thrilling, unpredictable bouts. He was often paired to fight with slower, heavier types like Mormilos, for instance. He would use his superior speed and swiftness to create separation with his long trident. This repurposed fishing tool was nearly two meters long and its prongs were used to stab opponents or to pull away their weapons and armor. The prongs weren't sharp enough to pierce straight through metal, but they definitely hurt every time they landed. Ferretti Arius with the most skill and accuracy would target the open and vulnerable parts of their opponents. The very best at the Arius could spear their opponents through the small eye holes in their helmets. It didn't always go to plan though. If everything went wrong, a Arius would need to equip his dagger. As a last resort, Arius Arius would slide his hand deep into his loincloth and whip out his Pugio. Arius Arius probably hoped they never had to resort to this strategy mid-fight, if the fight became a close quarters battle, they had virtually no chance of beating an armored opponent who had a sword and a shield. Pugio were most often used by Retiarius to finish off their disarmed opponent, who was on the ground, trapped in a net. This net was the only other form of offense that Retiarius had. A fisherman's net sounds like an absolutely rubbish weapon. If you lost your net, and God forbid your trident, you'd have about as much chance of survival as a spectator wearing a bullseye print toga in a Sagittarius archery fight. If you threw out your net, and it didn't entangle your opponent, you're pretty much screwed. Because of this, all Retiarius spent a very long time training and developing their net throwing skills. They threw their net using their offhand with an underhanded flicking motion, but this maneuver was high risk, high reward. If the net landed and caught the opponent, it was game over for him. Here's the risk. If he missed his opponent with a net throw, it was bad news. Bad news. Think about it, he'd literally be running around half naked with a trident, jabbing at his opponent's feet until he was inevitably cornered and caught. The rewards were huge for a successful Retiarius, but with this came a short shelf life. Everyone knew their faces and names if they strung together arena victories. The lack of a helmet and armor made them visible celebrities. Famous Retiarius were said to catch many young women in their nets. Outside the arena, of course. All they had to do was continue winning, and the riches and women would be lining up for them in droves. This would not be easy though. An aggressive, horrifying new competitor was designed specifically for them. Forged out of the depths of Roman bloodlust, this relentless, haunting new opponent was set loose in the arena. His goal? Make the life of Aretiarius as painful as possible. Secuto. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of Aretiarius. They open up the arena doors and you're now face to face with this chilling character. You're half naked, you've got a rubbish weapon. Weapon is in bold, bold air quotes here. A weapon your local fisherman uses to catch fish. Oh, and you have a net. At least you know if it all falls apart you can reach into your loincloth and unsheath your pugio. Alright, now it's time to fight. Go on, throw out your net. Good luck. Here's the first problem for Auretiarius. It's this menacing custom helmet. 
looking at this helmet, what's your first thought? Yeah, I know it's freaky looking, but check this out. Okay, so the fight has started now and you throw out your net. It's the big moment and yes, nailed it. It's a bullseye, a perfect headshot. All that training has paid off, but don't celebrate yet, Reziarius. The helmet is so smooth and streamlined that the bloody net slides straight off it. Would you want to be a Retiarius trying to throw a fisherman's net over this thing? No, absolutely bloody not, right? It's intentionally designed with smooth curves, they act as a kryptonite to the weighted net. But that's not all. This helmet has another trick up its sleeve. Look at these creepy eye holes. It's not easy to get the prongs of a trident through like some of the previous helmets. However, these helmets were not perfect. The Sukultor inside could barely see a thing. A really bad time with a nimble, unarmored opponent darting around you. Made of solid bronze metal, they were back-breakingly heavy. The Sukultor would begin to feel its weight after no time. Korea Sukultors, men who spent their lives as these gladiators, they probably developed the crippling forward head posture of a smartphone addicted teenager. Helmets were also form fitted to the head of a Sukultor and had awful ventilation, so very little air got in. Wearing this helmet, you could barely breathe. Oxygen was suffocatingly scarce. The lack of ventilation also caused you to cook under the hot Roman sun. Your brain began to boil as if a heavy form-fitted bronze oven was encased around your skull. The helmet was horrifically cramped. You'd feel trapped inside of it. Your only way out, through your opponent's defeat or a painful death. If you have even mild claustrophobia, you probably just launched your laptop out the window and I cannot blame you. As Sekultor tried to get the matches over and done with as quickly as possible. Grupalarius. Man, how cool do these guys look, hey? They wore armor from head to toe. Clearly the most heavily armored gladiators. No other class even came close. Equipped with a Gladius and a Scutum, Gruppalarius in the arena were virtually invulnerable. Their opponents got tired from sword swing after sword swing just bouncing off their impervious armor. These guys were sturdier than your old Nokia phone. There were very few, if any, Gruppalarius weaknesses. I mean, how would you even beat these guys, right? Our best answer to this question comes from a story of war. The Krupalarius were completely unstoppable. They were demolishing everyone on the battlefield as if they were Iron Age tanks. The battle was close to ending as Roman hope was crushed by the unbreakable army of Krupalarius. The Roman frontline soldiers were on the brink of surrendering. But a mob of secondary units suddenly charged forward. The Krupalarius were about to face a shocking new strategy that would lose them this battle. Their armor was hacked away with pickaxes. The best soldiers with swords didn't work, but a mob of pickaxe welding Romans did. Tacticus said that if they were knocked to the ground, their armor was so heavy that they couldn't get back up to their feet. So, that's how you beat them. Knock them down and call in the Italian pickaxe squad. Laquiarius. Laquiarius translates literally to snarer. Let me introduce you to gladiatorial cowboys. Whilst they didn't have the sheriff badges or the guns, they were equipped with a rope lasso. They had the simple goal of trying to catch an opponent with their rope so they could execute their most effective attack. They had a lasso in one hand and a gladius in the other. Romans didn't use lassoes in combat, so the common thought is that they were mocking a barbarian tribe they fought against at some point. The strengths of these gladiators were speed and range. 
they would keep their distance, trying to snare their opponent in the lasso. If they captured their enemy, they'd pull on the rope, tightening their control and dominating their opponent's balance. To ensure survival, as much distance as possible before a catch was essential. A lasso catch made closing the distance much safer. They could ready their sword and move in for the kill. Provocato. The Provocator or Challenger is one of the older gladiator types. The standard Gladius and Scutum returns, pretty much the same armor set up as usual too, with one visible exception. A little rectangular breastplate barely covering the chest. The Cardiophylax, a Greek word for partial breastplate, was made of a solid rectangular sheet of metal. This piece of armor was fastened to the gladiator using tough leather straps and was made to absorb immense damage. It was impervious to sword and spear attacks, rendering direct blows futile. It looks ridiculous though. Not so ridiculous as say it to a provocator's face, but it just looks silly. It's seemingly impractical, right? It looks like armor designed for a 12 year old. It looks like a lazy blacksmith left work early. It looks like a solid bronze gladiatorial crop top. Our boy has his stomach hanging out here. Like, seriously, it's far too short, right? I could only come up with three logical reasons why the Provocator is equipped with such a scant, stingy piece of armor. One, budget cuts. Two, the man running the gladiator's armory enjoys the sight of skimpy, manly midriff. 3. I suppose the Cardiophylax struck a balance between mobility and protection. If it extended all the way down his body, his movement speed would have been impaired. At least he didn't have to worry about being stabbed in the heart, I suppose. Equus Esedarius Mounted gladiators fought each other with long spears in Rome's version of a medieval joust. They wore minimal armor and brightly colored outfits to help the audience differentiate the combatants. If they found themselves dismounted, they'd defend themselves on the ground with a sword. Most scholars say they only fought other mounted gladiators because a gladiator on a horse or a gladiator in a chariot is simply way too overpowered when compared to a regular foot soldier. The only way a mounted versus unmounted fight would be somewhat fair is if the odds were severely stacked against the chariot or horse rider. Five gladiators on foot versus one mounted gladiator for example. Gladiatrix. It's not a question of whether or not women bravely fought in the arena. They did, and there are a few sources to back this up. These are few and far between, however, as it seems the Romans saw female gladiators as circus. Kind of in the same vein to how they amusingly viewed amphitheater dwarfs or cripples fighting. For us, I guess the equivalent of a female gladiator fight would be like cheerleaders coming out at half time. Don't get me wrong, it's fun to watch, but it's also a great time to go to the toilet and buy some snacks. The presence of female gladiators in the arena was one of the most controversial topics in Rome at the time. They weren't a highly valued part of the arena's showings. Gladiatrix only ever fought other females for obvious reasons. Andabata Andabata were typically criminals who had no fighting skills and zero ability with a sword. They were involuntarily shoved into the arena by officials equipped with nothing but a helmet and an old worn out gladius. They would wildly swing their swords around missing with almost every shot. This was a circus of flailing limbs and failed swordsmanship. The plight of the Andabata came down to one factor which I'm sure you've seen by now. 
they had no damn eye holes in their helmet. This was a blind fight, they couldn't see what they were swinging at. They were thrust into the arena with other blinded criminals in a last man standing death sentence. These guys technically weren't gladiators though. They had none of the training and most certainly none of the skill of the previously mentioned combatants. Cestus Cestus were hand-to-hand -hand fighters. They were named after the special gloves they used. A Cestus glove was originally just a leather hand wrap that extended up the forearm. Hand wraps like these help prevent the small bones in the hands breaking and allow the boxer to create a tighter fist. Basic leather hand wraps like these were invented by the Greeks originally. Apparently, boxing fights were boring according to the Romans. Boring boxing matches to the death received very little attendance. Rome needed to revise the events to reinvigorate viewership. Did they bring in better athletes, create better competition, modify the rules? No, of course not. They instead started adding metal plates and sharp blades to the gloves. Lovely. Wearing a bunch of heavy armor would have hindered movement and speed, so they fought on the brink of nakedness. Dimakairus Very little is known about this gladiator, other than the fact that they fought with two swords rather than one. Dimakairus only fought against other Dimakairus. I suspect this is because of how impractical and challenging it is to fight with two swords. You essentially have to fight in close quarters and block any shots with your sword rather than your shield. You'd also probably have to be relatively ambidextrous and a skilled swordsman otherwise you'd get wrecked. If both competitors have the same handicap of having to use two swords, it could definitely be an entertaining, highly skilled spectacle. The high skill level required to be a Dimakaitos would generate a high barrier for entry, preventing an abundance of dual sword competition. Bestiarius Veneto I wouldn't exactly call these guys gladiators because they didn't fight other men. They either fought or hunted exotic animals in the arena. Basically, they take on wild animals like hippopotamuses, crocodiles, tigers, deer, packs of dogs, bears, elephants, lions, I'm sure you get the idea. These animals were intentionally irritated to be exceptionally aggressive. The animals were also deprived of food and the proverbial hornet's nest was constantly poked. Some unlucky criminals and prisoners were just straight up fed to these animals without any weapons to fight back with. Caesar. Look at that thing attached to his arm. What a freaky abomination of a weapon that is. A truly terrifying contraption. This metal tube has an internal handle running parallel to the crescent shaped blade on the end. He'd hold the handle and swing the ridiculously sharp blade around and cut through his opponents like butter. This deadly contraption was also used to block enemy shots and pull away armor and shields. Appropriately, his name, Scizor, literally translates to Cutter. Just before you go into my next video, be sure to click subscribe so you don't miss out on my upcoming Gladiator and Ancient Rome videos. Check out the new Historia store if you want to support more work like this, link in the video's description. This has been Apollo for New Historia, I'll see you in my next video.